that I've Yeah, I'm, I'm the last. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Okay. I'm glad we got a hard copy of this. Yeah. Play it like Mark. Thank you for bringing it. Oh, you're welcome. That's great. <laughs> My logistical challenge <coughs> was overcome by Carried a little box. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's color, too. <laughs> we actually <laughs> dove into the color world for this. <laughs> yes. We went all out in this case. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, you do. <laughs> with the Odin visit and my yeah. that's, that's going down. I enjoyed mm -hmm. the earpieces on it. Yeah. Several others. And a couple of days here where I've been having to decline and apologize to, to press who wanted to, you know, do interviews or contact me just because I haven't been haven't uh, been able to get up and about. I just wanted to introduce myself. Parit Subhan Foreign Secretary of Bangladesh. Yeah. And an old friend of Bob and, uh, and also Miss Saman, who used to be an Ambarin. Uh, you know? Oh, yes, yes. A fellow, yeah. Yeah, she's, I think she left a few she's left. months she's ago. Left. Yeah. Bob is around, though. He's um, eventually on vacation for the next few okay. weeks. Okay. I'll, certainly so I'll say him hello to him. Absolutely. And, of course, uh, Hiram Milam is an old friend. Okay, great. So we'll catch up one of these days. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's really nice to meet you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Kugelman. I am the uh, Deputy Director with the Wilson Center's uh, Asia Program and also the Wilson Center's Senior Associate for South Asia. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us for this event, which is occurring as part of the Wilson Center's Inda India in Asia Initiative. I also wanted to thank the uh, Wilson Center's uh, Kissinger Institute, our institutional co-sponsor for today's event. Uh, just very uh, quickly, a few words about the Wilson Center and what we do. The Wilson Center is chartered by Congress uh, as the official memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. It serves as the nation's key nonpartisan policy forum for tackling global issues through independent research and open dialogue to inform actionable ideas for the policy community. Uh, and in the spirit of President Wilson, who, as you all know, is the only U.S. president to have had a Ph.D., uh, we build a bridge between the worlds of academia and public policy to inform and develop solutions to the nation's problems uh, and challenges. So the relationship between Japan and India has been called the fastest growing strategic relationship in Asia. It's a pretty solid relationship overall. Uh, one might even call it something close to foolproof. Uh, it's driven in great part by some shared concern about China, but also by a number of uh, other convergences, including some economic synergies, quite a few economic synergies. Um, the U.S. government has long been a strong supporter of the India-Japan relationship. Uh, as many of you will know, there's been a U.S.-Japan-India trilateral arrangement in place for quite a few years. Uh, and after the very recent meeting between President Trump and Prime Minister Modi here, um, in a statement in the Rose Garden, Trump brought specific attention to the uh, U.S. to U.S.-India-Japan naval cooperation, and he referred to the fact that. Uh, uh, we'll, be, we'll soon be having the annual naval exercises between the, the three countries happening uh, just a bit later this summer. Uh, there's good reason to believe that this robust support for the India-Japan partnership will continue, even though to this point uh, the Trump administration's Asia policy, so to speak, remains quite uh, undefined, to say the least. So we're very pleased this morning to be hosting the uh, public release of, a, of an excellent new report on the India-Japan relationship produced by National Defense University. Hopefully you all saw them outside. If not, please grab one on the way out if you didn't get one on the way in. Um, Tom Lynch, who is one of the report's co-authors, will be highlighting the report's main points and its takeaways and 
He'll also speak a bit uh, on the uh, implications of this relationship for both Washington and Beijing. Uh, many of you will know Tom. Um, he's a distinguished research fellow for South Asia and the Near East at the uh, National Defense University. He was the Special Assistant for South Asian Security Matters for uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen, from 2008 to 2010. Uh, he was an Army Regional Support Commander with responsibilities for Afghanistan from 2005 to 2007. He was also a Special Assistant to the CENTCOM Commander for South Asia Security Issues from 2004 to 2005, and he was also a Military Special Assistant to the U.S. Ambassador to Afghanistan in 2004. Uh, we also uh, have two other panelists who will be weighing in this morning, both of whom I'm proud to say are based here at the Wilson Center, and they allow us the opportunity to uh, showcase some of the really great breadth of expertise that we have in-house. Uh, first of all, it's an honor to introduce uh, Ambassador Nora Pamarao, who is a public policy fellow at the Wilson Center. As many of you will know, she's one of India's most distinguished diplomats. She was India's ambassador to the U.S., to China, Peru, Bolivia, and Sri Lanka. She also was India's foreign secretary, um, and she held a number of other senior positions in the Indian Foreign Service. And more recently, she's held a number of academic positions uh, at Harvard University, the University of Maryland, and at Brown. Uh, and she's uh, here at the, at the Wilson Center working on a book on India-China relations. And finally, uh, Shihoko Goto is the senior associate for Northeast Asia with the Asia program here at the center. She's also a contributing editor at The Globalist and a senior non-resident fellow at Morocco's Institute Amadeus. And before that, she was a financial journalist um, for a number of media outlets, including National Journal uh, and Dow Jones. Um, with that, uh, we're going to hear consecutively from our three speakers. Tom will kick things off, then we'll hear from Nora Palma and Shihoko, and then I may pose a few questions before we have a uh, discussion with all of you. So. With that, Tom, I uh, cede the floor to you. Great. Well, thanks so much, Michael. Um, and thanks to you all. It's my distinct pleasure to be back here at the Wilson Center among colleagues and friends who focus and specialize in the same area that I do uh, over at National Defense University. As Michael mentioned, that specialization is in South Asia. Uh, the Near East, for me, defined mostly as the Gulf Arab states and then also countering radical Islam. Um, it's, a, it's a treat to be back here um, and on a panel in the DS with the, uh, the experts from the Wilson Center, who I've always found to be both uh, uh, collegial, collaborative, and insightful in all these matters. And uh, so, uh, Shioko and Ambassador, terrific to be here with you today, and I look forward to our exchanges. Let me just start off by also thanking uh, Michael uh, and the Wilson Center, as well as the uh, uh, India uh, in Asia uh, initiative, which I think is a powerful and important one, as is probably um, self-evident by the title of the monograph I'm going to talk about here in a couple of seconds, as well as the Kissinger Institute. It's always a delight to be here and to get a chance to exchange views and ideas, uh, and I always leave here having learned something and taking something back to my own research and my own frame of, of, of reference. So I'm delighted today to be here and talk about uh, what I uh, believe and have been trying to track um, in my own research at National Defense University uh, over the past three years as the most dynamic and arguably the most uh, uh, enticing uh, bilateral relationship developing in uh, the world today, and that is the relationship between India and Japan. Um, I have been aware of it for quite a while, but uh, took it on for extensive study research to include field study and research uh, with my colleague who does Far East security studies at uh, National Defense University, Dr. Jim Pership. Uh, Jim regrets not being able to be here today. Um, he is uh, traveling actually in the Far East right now. But Jim and I in late 2014 approached the Department of Defense and said, hey, what do you folks know about what's going on between India and Japan right now? And the responses we got back in the policy shops and the military side indicated uh, general, uh, very wave tops understanding of the fact that they were involved, they were engaged, and they were doing certain things in the security side. But in our travels, mine to India and uh, the South Asia region and Jim's to the Far East, we were detecting an awful lot more dynamism. And indeed, with the arrival of Prime Minister Modi, we saw that dynamism between the relationship really accelerate. So at that point in time, we were able to encourage our sponsors over at the Department of Defense to empower us to go forth and both do uh, desk side research, interviews, studies, and then also travel extensively in India and Japan to look at this relationship and look at it from all dimensions and make some assessments about it in terms of what it means in the short, mid, and long term to U.S. security interests and to the security interests of others worldwide. 
It's from that perspective that the reports you see here uh, displayed outside today and that I'm going to talk through briefly uh, originated. Uh, it's that uh, time in the field, that time talking to both uh, uh, experts in India and Japan who've been around and involved in the relationship for a long time, and then applying the expertise of those uh, here uh, in Washington, D.C., and who we were able to contact during the period of about 18 months of research that put together the monograph you see here. So I'm excited today to highlight and hit the, hit the very basics uh, of what we concluded in this report, but then also acknowledging that our research on this report concluded at the end of 2016, and this report went to publication and was first circulated in March and April uh, in the defense and interagency community uh, and is now, as Michael mentioned today, for the first time being rolled out for open source publication for everybody to have access to. Let me highlight what's in the report and then also offer a, perhaps a chance to think and extend beyond that report about where we are and where we're going and uh, to perhaps discuss more explicitly the implications of this relationship for Washington as well as for Beijing. So with that as my uh, agenda and my orientation, let me, let me say that I'd prefer to talk here in, in, in about uh, six discrete clusters before uh, turning it over to my distinguished colleagues and, uh, and hearing from them and getting on to conversation. First, I'll talk about what I would say is basically the strategic context of the emerging relationship. Secondly, I'll highlight areas that, uh, that we have found in our research and we've written about as being the key elements of uh, diplomacy and culture that, uh, that fuse this relationship and make it somewhat unique and special. Third, a talk about uh, economics and politics, something that often gets lost in translation when you're talking about security relationships, but that uh, I and, and my co-author believe are very important to understand in terms of the, the uh, significance of the relationship between India and Japan. Um, then I will fourth talk about what I would consider to be military strategic imperatives on the part of both parties, that is getting more into the uh, dynamics of security and defense. And then I'll end with two categories, one about implications for Washington, and then <coughs> finalize and conclude with some very uh, basic uh, implications uh, for uh, China. Uh, and I'll, I'll highlight right now, and I'll mention again when I get to that point of my presentation, that our monograph does not go into detailed implications for China. Uh, it was more oriented towards U.S. policymakers, so it'll be great for us to have some more musings and speculations on the whole China uh, events as we get to today. So with that, then, let me start with the first uh, couple of categories and talk about strategic context. And I'd, I'd like to make several points in this area and, again, highlight and pull your attention to the actual monograph for more detail. Uh, let me start by talking about how the India-Japan relationship, I would argue, is really the outcropping of two parallel changes that are ongoing in the two societies. First, on the India side. As many of you in the room who are South Asia scholars will know, India has been on a process of long-term evolution and reorientation since 1991 and 1992. It was in those watershed years that India made the determination to break from what had been its kind of primary orientation uh, towards uh, the uh, Soviet Union and the Russia bloc for its main economic and political interaction, acknowledging that India was still the head of titular head of the non-aligned movement, but nonetheless that it had its primary orientation and integration for the previous 20 years with the Soviet Union and Soviet bloc countries and towards an opening to the wider capitalist world the policy framed by then Prime Minister Rao as the Look East policy. And indeed, that Look East policy has continued <coughs> with a lot of emphasis in the 90s and into the early 2000s on India not only liberalizing and loosening uh, the roles and the constraints in its own economy, but also looking heavily uh, towards trying to emulate uh, the economic uh, capitalist uh, powerhouses uh, that had developed in the 60s, 70s, and 80s in the Far East, that is, Singapore, uh, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, and Hong Kong. So that reorientation is an important uh, process that's been ongoing in India now for the better part of uh, almost three decades. And indeed, by the time we get to 2012, uh, we have increasing discussions about India going beyond looking east and now towards more acting east. And uh, while that was discussed in 2012 and 2013, many of you in the room will know that it was 2014 when our current Indian Prime Minister Modi actually came out and articulated in a speech in Myanmar that India was in fact now beyond looking east and now into acting east. And so it's in, in that um, framework 
uh, that India's look and attention towards the Far East and logically then towards Japan has been evolving and growing over time. Um, you will also note when you look in the monograph uh, that my colleague and I kind of established a, uh, a table or an appendix to kind of like talk and, and think through the major episodes uh, since 2000 that have occurred between India and Japan that have built the relationship. Um, and really that move uh, from 2000 forward uh, was a, a move uh, in our estimation uh, that was to enable a, a growth in, in economics uh, as, a, as a primary uh, interest between the two countries, but that that emerged um, uh, critically um, in the uh, mid-2000s um, as uh, Japan's uh, uh, move towards a more robust and a more um, uh, productive and uh, out, uh, outward-looking role in the Far East security uh, and dynamics came to the fore. And there were several things that went on in Japan in the uh, late 90s and early 2000s that came uh, into prominence during the research and the writing uh, on this piece, not the least of which was uh, Japan's reorientation of its uh, uh, overseas development uh, account, ODA, it's, it's, a, it's a primary uh, foreign investment funds from the government level, uh, reoriented it from more of a humanitarian frame of reference and aligning it more in the mid-2000s to more of a strategic a frame of reference, that is helping and assisting those countries that Japan believed uh, could help it with its primary uh, security concerns and those concerns that uh, would allow it to, uh, uh, to, to seek uh, uh, more autonomy and a wider array of, of partners uh, in its uh, quest uh, to uh, maintain its own domestic security as well as to deal with the challenges of a rising China. Now, the important parts here in terms of strategic context are not only then the, the, the rise of uh, you know, India as a critical player in the Far East, starting in 1991 and accelerating into the 2000s, and Japan's arrival as wanting to do more in its own security network and then reorienting and reorganizing and retargeting uh, its, uh, its uh, overseas uh, investment activities uh, to assist in that strategic frame of reference, uh, but also a growing convergence uh, in the two countries uh, that China's behavior was uh, not, uh, not moving in the direction that either Tokyo uh, or um, New Delhi would prefer. And uh, critically in that dimension, um, both countries, uh, India and Japan, uh, found themselves uh, by the late 1990s, early 2000s, heavily economically invested in China. Uh, that is, with absolutely no doubt that both countries had China as a primary uh, economics and trade partner. And so for both countries to continue with growth, economics, and development, uh, neither India nor Tokyo were going to be able to um, uh, energize or even uh, hint at direct provocation or uh, a challenge to China. But nonetheless, we're looking for um, other partnerships uh, that would allow China to know and would allow them to express uh, their mutual concerns about some of the activities that China was taking, uh, either in South Asia uh, with respect to concerns that India had security-wise, or in the Far East with security concerns uh, that Japan had. Uh, well, let me emphasize for India, though, that China, as a necessary economic partner, still throughout the entire period and up and through today, remains an overriding imperative. Indeed, when one looks at uh, India's uh, foreign policy aims, uh, number one in those aims is to, to sustain a robust growth in GDP because economics and economic growth and jobs and employment for India is its security framework. And when you look at that and you look at India trying to grow at rates of seven and a half, eight to nine percent per year just to keep on its glide path for success, uh, China remains indispensable in that process. Uh, China is far, far too important a partner for India right now, for India to do anything that would hint or signal uh, rapid, robust divestment, much less a rupture in economic relations. But nonetheless, India's growing concern in the mid-2000s about Chinese behavior uh, with and along the disputed areas of the border between uh, India and, and China, that vast track uh, uh, continued to gain attention and, and cause alarm in New Delhi as different activities occurred. And, uh, and uh, India saw uh, kindred spirit in Japan and Japan's challenges and worries and concerns about um, Chinese assertiveness and the Senkaku or the Daelu Islands. Uh, and so those things began to come together, uh, I, I, I would argue and have written in this, this piece, uh, to bring together what had been uh, economic development activities that were mutually beneficial to the two sides, to now have a shared agenda for um, 
a, uh, a partnership that would allow for uh, China to know that there were um, uh, a bilateral set of countries with concerns about their activity, uh, and also um, to allow the two countries, Japan and India, to more discreetly and directly um, uh, explore uh, the ability to diversify economic partnerships beyond China. Uh, both Japan and India by this time uh, in the mid-2000s are feeling uh, not only, one, that they're really invested heavily with China and can't abruptly break, but two, that they need to start developing alternatives so they're not totally dependent and become uh, so interdependent and intertwined with the Chinese economy that they can't take a stand in their own national security interests or in their own political interests that would uh, aggravate China and allow China uh, to respond in a way that would be uh, uh, of, a, of a blackmail-type nature for, for their economies. Right? And I mention all these things because right around this time in the mid-2000s, this, this move towards uh, diversifying economic partners and more strategic interaction between India, uh, India and Japan uh, coincided uh, with the arrival of uh, Prime Minister Abe 1.0 in Japan. And here Abe has a distinct, and I'll come back to it in a second, a, a distinct kind of a history uh, in, in Japan uh, given uh, who his father was, who his grandfather was, and what those interactions looked like uh, between India and Japan in, in previous eras uh, that Abe uh, keenly and, and deftly decided uh, to exploit during his first term and then has uh, accelerated uh, in his second term. So strategically, you have a relationship that has had a lengthy background, had an economic kind of start and framework to it in the 1990s and early 2000s, but increasingly in the mid-2000s came to be seen as a way to diversify more economically from China without rupturing economically from China, while still being able to send a, 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 uh, a, a stereo message of concern and worry about China's strategic behavior in the Far East and in the South Asia context, uh, you know, with voices from both Tokyo and New Delhi sounding resonant. Second, there's another aspect to this relationship that um, uh, observers in the region uh, quite often get, but uh, that observers from afar sometimes, I think, miss that's, that's important. And that is this issue of the second bullet there, diplomacy and culture. Specifically, and there is some dispute as to whether or not this is being played up too much in India and Japan, but the common historic connection between uh, the Buddhist tradition in India and Japan, and indeed the fact that the Buddhist tradition uh, began in India and spread to Japan during the seventh century, uh, that's become accept, accent, accentuated and emphasized a lot over the past uh, eight to ten years, uh, and particularly emphasized since the arrival of Prime Minister Modi in India. Uh, let me amplify here that it doesn't seem like Prime Minister Abe is uh, is, is out, of, uh, out of sync with Modi in this area. Both of them continue to always do meetings and, and have uh, photo ops and show and tells when they visit each other uh, at least a couple times a year uh, at various um, Buddhist uh, shrines, temples, and holy sites. And so this kind of notion that India and Japan have had this, this centuries-long historic relationship is something that's pretty, pretty key right now to the way in which the two countries interact with each other and the way in which they're trying to, to spread the common um, development and the common legacy. Now, it's true, of course, and quite as a matter of fact, that, that legacy hasn't been commonly shared and indeed was not one that was traditionally accentuated until the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, India and Japan have a relationship that is quite unique um, compared to particularly the other Southeast Asian states in the region. And in, that, in this case, uh, India has been, been keen to help and assist Japan um, to work and partner, not only economically but diplomatically, uh, to find opportunities for other economic growth and expansions <coughs> around Southeast Asia, with an eye and a notion to the fact that uh, India's um, perception of the Japan imperial colonial legacy is vastly different than the rest of the East, East Asian countries. Uh, let me re reframe that for you here, because I think it's an important marker to not lose track of. Uh, of course, um, the imperial Japanese expansion during World War II tried to appeal to nationalism in each of the countries that the Japanese overran. Um, that, that appeal was, was generally um, uh, uh, ill-received in all but a couple of cases. 
There was the case of the Kingdom of Siam, which is a different one we can talk about in Q&A. But then there was the case of India, where India was searching and thirsting for someone who would, who would bang the anti-colonial drum that had been one pursued so long by uh, Gandhi and Nehru and others. And so, as many of you will know historically, what happened during World War II was uh, there were large sections of India that uh, accepted and welcomed the Japanese um, uh, promise to overthrow Imperial Britain. And indeed, uh, over 20,000 Indians um, uh, quit and, and joined uh, the Indian National Army, which was uh, which fought as an appendage of the Japanese invasion forces throughout Southeast Asia, and especially into, into Burma and into Northeast India. Um, the, the consequence of that was, in, in, in a post-war world, um, there, there is not the legacy of, uh, of Japanese um, uh, perfidity uh, and horror uh, in the Indian tradition, and that allows for a, a lot more of a, a kind of a, a, a common uh, basis for discussion without the historic worries and antecedents. And so India believes itself, in some cases rightly, in some cases wrongly, as being able to soften the edge of Japan's increasing investment interests, increasing activities in Southeast Asia countries, because India sees and perceives what Japan can do uh, economically and strategically from a lens that's not tainted by the horrors of the World War II occupation period and, and framing. So this, this notion of kind of a better relationship, a, a, a less toxic relationship during World War II, and then the long-term cultural and, 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 uh, and, and uh, religious symbolism really has come to underscore uh, the unique nature of the, uh, of the two countries and what their promise for future collaboration is. Third, let me turn to the economics and politics and try to emphasize mostly here, if I could, the economic dimension of this with a little bit on politics. Here, economics are an incredibly important frame of reference in this relationship for both countries. Um, on the Japan side, our research d discerned that um, India is seen as uh, a large and uh, expanding market uh, with lots of potential in areas that Japan would like to do offshore investment in uh, to help grow and stimulate uh, Japan's largely sclerotic economy um, to allow it uh, to move forward in a faster and a better frame of reference than it has the last decade. Second, Japan has targeted investment in India to enable it, especially since the mid-2000s, to offer a counterweight of investment to large Chinese promises of investment, i.e. to help India as well as others in Southeast Asia, to not have to take large Chinese investments, but instead to allow strategic investment by Japan to be an alternative, an alternative model, an alternative framework. And here, from the India side, this has been incredibly attractive. And India, in, in governments starting uh, well back into the late 1990s and now moving forward, have been welcoming of Indian invest, a uh, question of Japanese investment into India, both direct government investment as well as business investment. And in that area, if you look over the last decade, Japan has been the largest growth investor, both in terms of its private investments as well as its uh, public investments in India of any other country. Indeed, there's been a dramatic rise in foreign direct investment from Japan since 2004, uh, which by 2008 was second only to Chinese foreign direct investment inside uh, India. Again, showing that alternative model so India can turn to another um, uh, partner in this process. Um, the uh, foreign direct investment for Japan into India has averaged about five billion U.S. dollars per year from 2007 to 2015, and both countries uh, aim to have this double. That is to be at about ten billion dollars of foreign direct investment by 2021. Um, we can talk in question and answer about how well that's going, but nonetheless, that's the aim, that's the objective, and that's important. Uh, in addition, um, Japanese overseas uh, d investment is critical in India because India needs partners that can do things that um, uh, walk up to the line of potential encroachment on Chinese interests. And particularly here, uh, I talk about Northeast India. Uh, and here for a long, long time, uh, India struggled and has not been able to find investment partners to go into Northeast India and help build up roads and rails and other infrastructure the, anywhere near the disputed territories of Ruknal Pradesh, uh, Sikkim, and some of the other locations. Uh, Japan is unique in this, in that Japan has historically, over the last decade and a half, but particularly in the last four to five years, been willing to ignore or brush off 
uh, subtle and sometimes unsubtle Chinese warnings about too much investment in these areas up to and akin to the disputed area and is plowed forward with investment programs and projects. Um, and in our monograph, we actually show uh, Japanese um, overseas development assistance projects uh, that were in 2015. And in that map, you'll see several of them up in Northeast India. Indian officials reminded my co-author co and I all the time that here is an area where Japan will go where others will not. Others will back off when China expresses concern. Uh, Japan has basically said, this is something we're going to invest in and we're going to share a strategic as well as an economic frame of reference in working with our Indian uh, infrastructure um, folks. In addition, strategic Japanese investment that goes beyond high-speed rail, large projects for roads and developments, special um, um, uh, capitalized cities initiatives, which Japan is playing in very extensively. It also includes some other strategic things that are a little more subtle, but I think are very important to mention here as we do in our monograph. First, as India starts to look more broadly at its strategic role and its security framework in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, looking at trying to be uh, more capable at a wider array of, uh, of locations, it has started to look at the uh, Adaman and Nicobar Islands uh, as an important place to have more research and resource capability. Well, in this process, to first have things done and have an expansion either of an you know, air um, uh, base or a naval base, uh, Adaman and Nicobar Islands needed some power resources. Well, here Japan stepped in two and a half years ago, came up with a civil, a civilian power generation project that was to be funded by uh, Japanese direct investment, uh, and India bought onto that. And the below the surface, beneath the lines uh, outcrop of that is not only will that power project that has now begun on the Adam and Nicobar Islands with Japanese funding improve the lives of the people on the island, but it'll also be a source of power for India to expand its naval base and its naval resources and also to expand its ability to situate a permanent set of uh, uh, search and rescue aircraft that also have the ability to search uh, and, and, and track uh, vessels of interest, i.e. Chinese uh, warships and potentially Chinese submarines going forward. So one of the other things that Japanese can do uh, at a very interesting uh, dimension. And then finally, uh, it's important to note that um, the economic dimensions of what uh, India does uh, and Japan does with <coughs> India, also extend beyond India. And, and here, um, India, uh, prior to uh, 2011 and 2012, had a, uh, a significant project in Charbahar, Iran, the port of Iran nearest to Pakistan, where it was trying to build out um, the port itself as well as uh, road and rail to move up in through East Ar uh, Iran and then connect into the ring road in Afghanistan with the idea of being able to bring resources out and have them utilized uh, you know, for Indian needs and others' needs. Uh, that kind of came to a brief halt for a while uh, as the whole international pressure on Iran for the nuclear program had gone on. But since May of 15, when the agreement was struck, the JCPOA to allow India, correction, to allow Iran to be, uh, you know, back out from under all these sanctions. India moved rather swiftly in less than a year uh, from the time of announcement of that JCPOA uh, to announce that it was going to be back investing in the char port of Charbahar. And that uh, as it did that, it uh, uh, did a ceremony with not only um, the leader of um, uh, Iran, the leader of Afghanistan, but also announced that Japan was going to be an investment partner in the port of Charbahar uh, for the build out there, which is a very interesting and fascinating approach to uh, India's uh, leverage of Japan initiative and uh, investment capability to help with a strategic maneuver to kind of do an in round of where Pakistan has been blocking off Indian access to Central Asia uh, and to uh, Afghanistan for all this time. Right? So um, indeed, on the economics level, uh, Japan is becoming an indispensable partner for India, both in terms of its internal economic aims, but as well as its uh, strategic aims, including examples in Northeast India, in the Adman Nicobar Islands, and then also in Charbahar. What about military strategic imperatives? And here I'll just touch briefly, since I've kind of covered some of these as we've already gone forward. Um, uh, the uh, the the key imperatives, I think, in terms of the military strategic dimensions uh, are as follows. Um, both India and China, oh, question, excuse me, both India and Japan really do and, 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 and have expressed that they have concerns about China's uh, growth 
as, and, and they see it as a country that's demanding its rights more than it is considering its responsibilities to the international order. And it's in this space where there really is, I think, in both the language and the orientation of the governments in Tokyo and New Delhi, a convergence. Um, and that is a, a, a worry that China is on a path of belligerence and of demand of its own rights that is going to lead to clash and crisis uh, in the Far East. And that India and Japan are best coupled together right now in trying to stand against that with the hopes that China adjusts and adapts course, but with a plan in place to move forward and continue should China not adapt or adjust its behavior. And of course, many of you are aware that the key strategic areas of concern right now for India, of course, it's its northern border area, a dispute uh, where a war was fought in 1962, which includes uh, 1,600 miles uh, of disputed borderline and over 800,000 uh, square kilometers of territory. Um, and India, of course, also has issues with China's support for Pakistan. Uh, it grows increasingly concerned now about Indian Ocean naval presence, uh, it, fearing that patterns that are being established in the far Pacific may be also encroached into the uh, Indian Ocean. Uh, and also, it's important to note here that India has concerns with China uh, over Tibet. And we can go into this more in conversation uh, as well. But, uh, you know, India's concerns with Tibet have to do with what it believes is a, a Chinese failure to follow through on a promise in the 1950s of honoring the cultural uh, and the uh, social autonomy of Tibet uh, that that is being encroached upon. And, of <coughs> course, uh, India then shares with Japan that concern and therefore is aligned with uh, J Japan's uh, proclamations and concerns over the Senkaku Islands. And here, there's been no great movement by India to do anything dramatic in terms of supporting Japan with uh, respect to the Senkaku Islands. But if you look carefully at the record, every time India has been given an opportunity in the UN to speak out, it has spoken out in favor of the uh, Japanese claims on the Senkakus uh, and cautioned other parties, Red China, uh, to acknowledge and honor those claims. Uh, and I also mentioned that since this monograph was written, we, of course, we've had a decision um, about um, some of the uh, South China Sea Islands uh, taken on behalf of the International uh, Court uh, in favor of the Philippines. And uh, India did in issue a foreign ministry statement encouraging all parties to honor those international norms and those uh, considerations. So in that space, India and Japan have uh, military strategic imperatives that do uh, really align. And I should also mention here that India and Japan have been conducting joint Coast Guard operations for well over a decade. Uh, they do a lot of exchange uh, in the naval arena. And uh, now, as of 2015, uh, India has welcomed Japan as a permanent partner. In Japan had been a uh, a temporary partner, but a permanent partner in an annual exercise known as the Malabar Exercise, which has been a U.S.-India joint uh, naval exercise uh, for well over two decades. But now with Japan as a permanent partner uh, in that, kind of sending a message of, of moving beyond and moving Japan into that, that security framework that India is developing with the U.S. and others. So those are the key points I'd like to highlight. There are several others in the monograph, and we, we can go into them in question and answer. But what about tagging out here in terms of you know, perspectives for the U.S. and then perspectives for China. <coughs> Let me talk about the U.S. first. And again, the monograph goes into a lot of this, and I'll just highlight a couple of the things that I think are, are, are important um, about past and future. First, as noted in the monograph, uh, it, there's very clear evidence that both India and Japan have taken signaling from the United States over the last 15 years about when and how to warm their relationship. Uh, and the, uh, in the appendix of the monograph, you'll see we, we kind of track uh, not only visits by U.S. presidents being followed quickly by visits of uh, Indian or Japanese prime ministers to each other's countries, but also U.S. declarations of certain um, more um, strategic intent with respect to India being followed up by similar language and similar uh, extensions with Japan. So the, the offshoot of that is that for the last 20 years, really since 2000 and the visit of President Bill Clinton, it's very apparent that India and Japan have taken positive signals from the United States about Japan and India as room for them to move closer together. Now, we conclude in the monograph that this has an independent momentum and an independent initiative, but nonetheless, there's pretty clear evidence that the more the United States signals its appreciation and its uh, interest in this partnership, the, the more that India and Japan seem to be able and willing to do together. Second, 
we make a conclusion in there that uh, for now, this India-Japan relationship is emerging and developing as a strategic partnership that is a great complement to, but not a substitute for, U.S. direct involvement militarily, economically, and diplomatically in the region. Okay? We're not at a time where one can look at this and say, oh, it's time to step back and allow them to do more. No, I, I mean, that's, we're, we're not at that point. There's not enough capacity either in the Japan security forces who are evolving and developing on their own right now under some new legislative authorities, nor in India with its own um, kind of limited uh, air and sea projection capabilities to step in as a, as a uh, substitute for the U.S. 7th Fleet or for our own diplomacy in the region. But nonetheless, it's an important complement that as we look to ask uh, other countries to do more in that region for their own security, we need to recognize that uh, our own role there needs to remain firm, at least for now, and then moving forward. And then what about the future? Uh, I think into the future, uh, our signaling not only in general areas about the importance of the relationship, but also in more um, specific areas. And, I, and what I mean by this is areas where now that Japan is able to actually um, enter, as it has for the last year, uh, into the business of uh, uh, military hardware sales and uh, military hardware interaction, something it hadn't been able to do until the laws were changed a year ago, uh, that if we are positive and encouraging of Japan to do exchanges and allow interoperable transfer of military equipment, command control, communications, um, uh, quiet submarine technology, all those types of things. Allow Japan and India the, the, the breathing room to do that with our encouragement, uh, if not assistance, that those types of things will further help their capacity to come up, their interoperability to come up, and allow them to more and more take on roles, not now, not in five years, but beyond that, in providing net net security, particularly in the Indian Ocean, but then also eventually in the South China Sea and some of the, uh, some of the sea areas uh, beyond that. Uh, next, what about the status with China? Well, here, I, mean, I look forward to more uh, detailed discussion uh, with the group. Um, for I think where we stand right now uh, with this relationship in China is probably best understood as kind of a uh, short-term, mid-term, and long-term kind of framework. Uh, in the short term, as I mentioned earlier, both Japan and India would much prefer China to continue its rise with an amelioration of its, its frame of reference for how it deals with freedom of navigation at the seas, for how, how it deals with cultural autonomy in places like Tibet, for how it deals with nationalist frenzy on certain periods and certain times, for how it actually allows its people to represent themselves in governance in China. Both countries still would prefer to see that as the outcome. China's rise then have uh, political accommodations within the country and an alignment with international norms, procedures, and consultations in the security arena go more forward. Yet both countries remain very concerned about how China is acting on the major disputes of the day. South China Sea, Senkakus, and the fact that there's been more than 40 years of negotiations about the border uh, with, between India and China with no resolution in sight, and not, not only that, but no agreement on the rules of how they would resolve the border dispute in sight. So I think in the short term, there still is a hope that there could be some uh, development. And indeed, the hope is anchored on the fact that both India and China are very anchored and still will be reliant for the foreseeable future on interaction with the Chinese economy to meet their economic growths. But in the midterm, both countries are trying to limit their dependencies on China. Both are trying to find alternatives with reciprocal investments and investment projects in other places in Southeast Asia. Again, trying to limit the exposure to the Chinese um, economic juggernaut uh, as a limitation to uh, what they might be able to do politically and socially in the other areas. And then long term, I mean, there remains this desire to find a common vision and an agreement to resolve these disputes, the northern border area, the Senkakus, the transit rights in the south area. But what's clear is India and Japan have a common framework about how those disputes should be resolved. Um, that framework, again, hearkening back to the role of the U.S., really aligns with um, a document signed by President Obama and Prime Minister Modi in January of 2015. That document, known as the Joint Strategic Vision for the Indo-Asia Pacific Region, really lays out a series of, of, of principled ideas. Freedom of navigation, <coughs> peaceful settlement of disputes, um, admission and succession to international courts of arbitration, uh, 
honoring human rights, a number of principles and values that the U.S. said, this is the, the common ground for our bilateral relationship. Well, not surprisingly, a year later, in December of 2015, on Prime Minister Modi's visit to Japan, India and Japan signed their own India-Japan strategic vision for the Indo-Pacific region. And guess what the primary topics of alliteration were there? Almost to a one, similar to the U.S.-India strategic vision. So what's developing here for the long term is really a long-term convergence about what India and Japan see as necessary for a stable and successful Indo-Asia-Pacific region and for their own countries and what the United States sees. And at this point, those principles, at least many of those principles, do not align with the way in which China is behaving. And so how China's behavior adjusts or adapts is going to be very important to where this relationship goes as well, whether it gets more focused on security and tightened tensions or whether it can be more expansive in economic areas and invite China in to play more. Right now, I think the jury is still out. But what we see happening here is India and Japan hedging their bets against a future with China not being a friendly participant in the global world order. So they are becoming more economically integrated, more diplomatically integrated, and eventually more security integrated. And for now, that they work with and within a framework of what they hope will continue into the near to midterm future, and that is U.S. presence, U.S. oversight, and U.S. management of uh, the security and economic regime in the Indo-Asia Pacific region. With that, I thank you for your attention. I thank you for being here, and I look forward to the comments of my fellow panelists. Thank you, Michael. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom. Really did a, a really great job of uh, tracking how this relationship has evolved and what motivates it and what its uh, future trajectories could be. Um, but indeed, let's, uh, let's go to our uh, two other panelists just to offer some, some brief uh, remarks. Um, and uh, we're first going to hear from Shihoko. Thank you. Um, Tom, that was a really good summary of a really very comprehensive monograph. I really do want to congratulate you um, on, on not just the content, but also the timing. What a brilliant time to actually come up with this report. Um, there are, of course, high expectations for the two so-called middle powers of Asia to counterbalance the idea of a G2 world, or that the idea of Asia being a binary region, uh, with the alternatives being either a China-led order or a US-led order. And uh, we've known that there is closer um, relations between India and Japan on security issues, and we've talked about the Malabar exercises, um, amongst other issues as well. But in this monograph, um, I found that there were three issues that focused on what the strategy may be in moving forward with the cooperation between India and Japan. And there's three issues um, that I really want to focus on very briefly because I do want to give time not just to have the ambassador talk but also to open up for what I am expecting a very lively discussion. But the three issues that I really wanted to highlight were um, the broader strategy in dealing with the changes in the regional balance of power that New Delhi and Tokyo share. Then secondly, how um, economic strategy has evolved over the decades and where they may be heading. And then prospects for the trilateral uh, strategic uh, India-Japan-US relations. So on the first point, in defining a common strategy uh, to deal with the new realities, I found that in the monograph you actually laid out three periods, and that the first period uh, you broke down from 1945 to 1999. And you argue that during that time, the economic uh, relations were solid. Um, but it wasn't um, really politically driven because of that distance between um, the, the India looking more towards the Soviet Union and during the Cold War and Japan very much firmly in the U.S. camp. I think it's also important to bear um, to note that strong um, economic relations between India and Japan since 1945 actually started um, with India providing uh, development assistance um, to Japan. And diplomatic relations post-war actually was initiated on the part of India as well. Uh, we saw cultural diplomacy, for instance, by the giving of elephants uh, to the Japanese public, almost like panda diplomacy by China today. Um, so there is a long history there, but it was, uh, as, as you point out, until 1999, it was um, very much focused on, on economic um, issues. 
Um, but since 2006, with the advent of the first um, Abe government, we've seen a much broader, richer engagement between the two countries. Now the question there becomes, can this current phase of deepening ties be as long as the first phase that lasted over half a decade? And I believe that lies, the answer lies in part where Tokyo and New Delhi's perception of threat from China either converge or diverge. And for, for now, and I think you've highlighted this very much, uh, there is greater convergence and there is a desire in offering a third way to China's grand strategy of regional development and consolidation on the one hand and a concerns united in their concerns about um, uncertainties of U.S. commitment to the region on the other. But that said, I believe there are already some signs of divergence. Um, one specific example, for instance, would be regarding uh, China's uh, One Belt, One Road, now called Belt and Road Initiative, I believe. Um, for instance, uh, neither Japan nor the United States is a member of the AIIB, the Asian uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank, but India did join. But Ironically, um, the, last, the latest Belt and Road uh, Forum, um, Japan actually attended with uh, the Secretary General of the uh, ruling Liberal Democratic Party, Toshiro Nikai, going with a letter, personal letter from P Prime Minister Abe. Uh, on the other hand, India did not participate. Japan hinted that <coughs> there is the potential of um, it possibly joining the AIIB down the line. What would that mean for Japan's relations with India down the line? But for now, there is, a, uh, there is unity between the two countries in understanding the limitations of the existing system, and both countries are willing to work together to rally smaller Asian countries with an alternative uh, to uh, depending too heavily on aid from China and adhering to a vision led by China. And, but to make that actually viable, what India and Japan really need to step up on is to secure financial as well as um, military resources as quickly as possible and as strategically as possible so that they can appeal to the nations of Southeast Asia needing that economic as well as security assistance. Um, on the second point um, regarding um, economic strategy and its evolution, um, what Japan's um, unfailing objective is to see a strong and prosperous India. And that a strong and pr prosperous India is not only good for Japan's economic future, but also for its security future as well. I found in the monograph um, a very um, striking data. You point out that in 2011, uh, there were 272 Japanese corporate members of the Japan Chamber of Commerce of India. And just 12 months later, that number rose to 926, which is huge. During that same 12-month period, the United States may uh, remain more or less flat at 500 members. So that in itself really shows the, um, the uh, interest of corporate Japan into India as well. It's also interesting that you pointed out that Japan never wavered from providing ODA to India even after the, uh, it's, it, the blight of Fukushima and the nuclear and earthquake disasters that struck Japan. Japan really had to shrink its um, development assistance uh, strategy at that time, but for India that never wavered. So there's clearly a strategic interest as well as corporate interest in there as well. And it has, of, of course, um, when you see the map, um, it's interesting to see that it's around the coastal area. So it, it really is about strategic development. It focuses um, in large part on big um, infrastructure and development projects uh, that lead to national growth. It's, it's not focused so much in the inner regions of India. So it's not, it, it demonstrates um, clearly that this isn't about humanitarian assistance. This is very much about economic growth and making sure that India achieves that level of um, economic state, um, status. Um, I, but beyond that, beyond that bilateral um, relationship, it's interesting to see that um, there's greater coordination between Tokyo and New Delhi in providing assistance to Southeast Asia, especially to Burma. Um, and 
it has, both countries have emphasized the fact that the type of development that they're willing to offer is very much different from that provided by China. And the case in point there is really the examples in um, Sri Lanka and in Cambodia, two countries which are facing tremendous problems in servicing their debts and obligations to the Chinese government. And they are, the, both uh, India and Japan are really stepping up the fact that they, they can actually provide um, assistance in a way that is very much different from what the Chinese are offering. We've, you've talked about um, uh, uh, development of ports in, in Iran as well. This is something that also is going through. But also, the two countries are working closely together to uh, cultivate um, economic opportunities in, in Africa as well. And I, I think that cannot uh, be um, belittled given the fact that China is the, um, uh, the biggest investor in Africa at the moment. And the, uh, the race for resources in Africa and indeed in Latin America will only intensify in coming years. And these are all part of a broader strategy for dealing with the new realities, not just in, Asia, in the Asia-Pacific region, but uh, more worldwide. Um, from Japan's perspective, beefing up ties with India does make strategic sense. Um, as Tom noted, uh, the Japan's relations with India is unencumbered, more or less, by history. And Japan uh, is at the crossroads right now insofar as it does place an emphasis on the, its, its uh, relations with the United States, but it is moving forward also with strategic hedging. There are worries already about a U.S. retreat, even before the Trump administration. There's concern about uh, the rapid militarization of China, um, as well as the North Korea threat well before the advent of President Trump. And so what Japan has done in recent years, as you may know, okay. is um, it has reinterpreted its constitution uh, so that it can be more proactive in engaging in, in collective self-defense. Um, and there is talk at the moment um, of actually uh, re revising that constitution altogether uh, so that Japan has greater capacity to play offense as well as defense. Um, there has also been a lifting of the ban on exporting military technologies and knowledge, and India has been a major beneficiary of such legal changes. And Japan in 2013 established the National Security Council um, which strengthened the position of the prime minister's <coughs> office and has a, a better ability to come up with bigger plans, bolder plans, five-year visions, as opposed to simply uh, being more uh, dependent on the bureaucracy um, at the ministerial level. And, of course, um, this makes it a lot easier, this consolidation of power and greater emphasis on the cabinet office in Japan, for Abe to really move forward with his plans for his strategic vision for, for India, which he had outlined a decade earlier. So Japan may actually not have a grand strategy, but as I said, it really is about strategic hedging. And it is clear that India can be a key partner in ensuring stability and ensuring that the rule of law prevails and that there is continued commitment for economic growth uh, with free markets and, um, and free and fair trade rules. Um, on the third point, uh, the strategic outlook for India, Japan, and US trilateralism, I felt um, that was possibly um, a little bit of, of the weakness of this particular monograph because, um, as you said, it, this d was uh, released, uh, completed at the end of last year, and things have obviously changed tremendously since. And, but the down, I guess the downside of that is that things will continue to, uh, things will continue to change rapidly. Um, but the uncertainty uh, of U.S. policy means that the United States is actually the wi wild card for India, Japan, and for all Asian nations um, seeking greater inter integration and looking for alternative, bolder, uh, long-term visions <coughs> that can compete with the vision that China is outla um, outlining. 
Um, I should point out, though, that Japan does actually have very strong relations with the Trump government, um, even though um, the Abe administration made clear that it would have preferred a Hillary win. It actually <laughs> went out of its way to, to greet uh, President Trump soon after his election. Uh, Prime Minister Abe was one of the first um, Prime Minister, uh, le world leaders to actually have a face-to-face -face with him in the White House as well. Uh, they play golf together. They have a good um, uh, personal relationship, and I believe that personal relationships matter greatly in this current White House. That said, the, when you look at public opinion polls in Japan at the moment, um, the confidence of the Japanese public in U.S.-Japan <laughs> relations moving forward is... Go, growing lower by the day. So on the one hand, you would say that the Trump-Abe summit went well, 80% would support that according to some polls, but only about 20% see a, a, a solid future for U.S.-Japan relations under a Trump administration. Now, there are a number of reasons why Japan might uh, perceive the recurrent situation this way, um, but one is certainly that uh, the U.S. withdrawal from TPP, uh, one of the first decisions that the Trump administration made was to withdraw U.S. commitment from that uh, mega trade deal. Um, but the problem with that is that, as the Obama administration said, the TPP was an, a framework not only for greater economic efficiency and economic integration, but it was also seen as a diplomatic tool, that it was a tool to in ensure greater trust and cooperation between countries. And we've seen, for instance, uh, in the Japanese example, that trade relations actually lead to closer diplomatic and security ties. I'm thinking specifically about um, Japan's uh, trade agreement with Australia. The FTA that Japan signed with um, Australia actually led to greater uh, security ties and um, and uh, more confidence and and uh, between the two capitals, and a, a, an increase in military exercises and in a more comprehensive relationship between Japan and Australia. Certainly, this is something that Japan would want to seek with its other partners. And one of the questions that I would have for Tom is. Would, would that kind of uh, deep, deeper trade relation between Japan and India be a possibility? And if so, how would the United States um, assess that? Um, and then finally, um, the monograph argues that Tokyo could play a greater role in bringing India into trilateral relations should Washington allow it, quote unquote. Um, I'd like to conclude by asking a rhetorical question, um, which is that isn't one of the greatest risks facing the region now that of U.S. indifference, real or imagined, so that the debate isn't really about whether or not Washington would allow Japan to take on a greater role in bringing India into the trilateral fold. Rather, it's about um, dealing with the immediate threats that could strengthen trilateral relations. Um, this is an administration that is looking for deals and immediate um, uh, results. The immediate threats at the moment are North Korea. Um, they are the rise of China, territorial disputes. Um, I would like to hear your views about how trilateral cooperation could actually work towards some of those, um, dealing with some of those threats. So, thanks. Thanks, Yoko. It's added some really useful, important context, and particularly, if I like how you acknowledge the uh, some of the divergences in this relationship. I mean, we've talked about how this is a relationship that's going places, but uh, there's no such thing as a perfect relationship, whether in international relations or, or life more broadly. Um, uh, we'll now go to Ambassador Rao to uh, make a few comments before we open it up to the group. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Shiroko. Uh, I read through this uh, paper with a great deal of interest, and uh, of course I'll come to it, but I'd like to um, start by saying that the relationship between India and Japan, as seen from the Indian perspective, 
is an extremely special relationship. <coughs> and uh, if you ask any Indian, they'd probably give it a score of 10 out of 10. Because, uh, you know, everything uh, we've done with Japan in the last uh, 50 years at least uh, is really defined by its positivity, by its sense of affirmation. And even going back to, uh, you referred to ties in culture and uh, diplomacy. I'm, you know, going back to the start of the 20th century when you had people like Okakura with his Asia is one concept entering into this dialogue with people like Tagore and really <coughs> creating a new perspective about how peoples of Asia should look at their future in the world. So I think Japan has an important, uh, has had an important role to play in developing India's perspectives about Asia also. When it comes to, you know, the Second World War and how we looked at Japan, I must say here that even if we didn't have any strong uh, residual, let's say, objections to Japan's role in Asia during the Second World War, people like Gandhi did condemn the Japanese invasion of China. And there was this sense of bonding that we felt with the suffering that the people of China were experiencing in that phase. And of course, you know the story of Subhash Chandra Bose, one of our premier freedom fighters who, you know, fled India, went to Nazi Germany, but ultimately tried to build ties with Japan as it was occupying Southeast Asia. And you mentioned the whole uh, Indian National Army's genesis and, and the role that Subhash Bose played in this. So there are, you know, these shards of memory about this relationship that in the Indian psyche, as it were, remain as confirmation about Japan's closeness <coughs> to India in times of need, in times of uh, when we wanted, uh, you know, that kind of help. And during the Tokyo trials, I think the Japanese still remember the role of Justice Radha Binod Pal. He has a, in fact, he has a memorial in the Yasukuni Shrine, in fact. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, his, uh, that was one of the sole dissenting judgments, followed later by Netherlands and France, about the, um, you know, the uh, uh, decision to condemn the grade A uh, war criminals. Justice Paul looked at it really from the, from the, you know, the role that the Western countries were playing in terms of wreaking revenge, as it were, as he called it, on, you know, a defeated country. So I think the Japanese remember that also with, with some gratitude. Today, when you look at the, and you've referred to it in your paper, the special strategic and global partnership between India and Japan, this is the only country with which we have, you know, the adjective special uh, attached to strategic and global partnership. And I think for us, it, it's a word weighted with some meaning. And it speaks of the great rapport between the leaders of the two countries, Mr. Abe and Mr. Modi particularly, have established a great chemistry and communication between themselves. And I think in a way, when Mr. Modi came to Washington, uh, you know, the, he must have looked uh, <coughs> for some inspiration and uh, the power of example of Mr. Abe and the way he'd been able to build bridges with Mr. Trump. So, uh, Looking back at the, uh, again, coming back to, and I loved your reference in the report to India as a baby elephant. I've never heard of India being referred to, and I've often referred, uh, heard it referred to as, a, as one of those big behemoths, those big elephants that takes time to, to turn around. But I think the, the image of a baby elephant seems much more you know, flexible and fleet-footed than mm -hmm. the usual description. So. Um, India, you, um, uh, as India-US relations have grown and flourished, I think this, this is important, particularly in the present context, since Mr. Modi has just been uh, to Washington. So too have India-Japan relations flourished. And I think it, it's, uh, it's uh, relevant that you establish that uh, connectivity. But I also, I'd like to also mention in this context that Japan and India, there's a certain solidity and stability to this relationship 
that seems to have been unshaken over the years. And I'm even talking of 20, 25 years ago when you didn't have the security and defense component in this relationship to that extent. Japan was always seen as the country that was contributing to India's development in a very, very tangible and concrete way. And I was just looking at your map, Appendix A in your report, and the number of states with which Japan is involved in terms of uh, cooperation and development projects. And I, I counted 22 states out of 29. That's a big, big number. And as Shihiko, Shihiko mentioned, there's a lot in the coastal areas. It's a lot in the peninsular region of India, which looks out to the Indian Ocean on both sides, radiating west and east and south, but also in the interior, because you have projects in states like Bihar, in states like Rajasthan, in states like Madhya Pradesh, you know, uh, the interior, the literal hinterland, and, uh, and in Himachal in the north, bordering the Himalayas, Punjab bordering Pakistan, West Bengal bordering Bangladesh, and the Northeast, uh, these seven, uh, not all the seven Northeastern states, but certainly take Tripura and take Assam. And I, um, that's, that is, I think, important in the context of the Act East policy. Uh, we call it Act East now, which ties up very much with uh, Mr. Abe's, Prime Minister Abe's concept of a free and open, I think he called it, Indo-Pacific, and the Japanese have been the first to use the term Indo-Pacific, to my knowledge, and I, that, that uh, reference has now been picked up by the Americans also, and in the latest joint statement issued uh, after Mr. Modi came here day before yesterday, the term finds an important, uh, 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 is an important part of the statement when it comes to defining a vision uh, for, the, for the region. I, so in some ways, I think Japan has set a trend when it comes to defining India's role in the region and recognizing the importance of what India can do as, uh, as a balancing power in many ways, uh, together with cooperation with Japan and the United States, when you contemplate the rise of China and the growing assertiveness of China. Next month, Japan, India, and the United States will have the next, uh, you know, installment, as it were, of the Malabar naval exercises in the Bay of Bengal this time. And for us, the Bay of Bengal has many, I think, important connotations because even as we talk of the Indian Ocean, the Bay of Bengal has been our sea of connectivity, as it were, to Southeast Asia and to East Asia. When you look at the long history of migration, when you look at the long history of oceanic trade, when you look at the flow of ideas, when you look at the flow of cultures, Indian culture going into Southeast Asia and meeting Chinese culture there, which is how the term Indochina came about. So for us, I think it has a lot of um, important historical and uh, contemporary uh, connotations. Japan's role, uh, coming again to the importance of this relationship in India's development today. Mr. Modi keeps talking about development literally being the hard truth, to use Tang Xiaoping's words, when it, co when it comes to India today. And it, when you look at infrastructure, when you look at investment, when you look at make in India, which is uh, you know, the great um, you know, story coming out of India today, you find a Japanese presence in all of this. Japan is one of the leading foreign investors in India today, fourth or fifth by various definitions. But the look at the metro rail projects in our cities, look at the concept of smart cities that Modi is trying to develop, look at, look at the freight corridors that are being established between important metropolitan centers in India, and connectivity to Southeast Asia because the Bangalore-Chennai corridor, for instance, is designed to connect with Southeast Asia. When you look at cooperation in the northeast of India, which I've always felt is where Southeast Asia <coughs> begins. In many ways, India is not just a South Asian country. It is a Southeast Asian country. When you look at the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, which you mentioned, are so close to the coast of Indonesia, barely a heartbeat away from Indonesia. And you look at our northeastern states, 
which uh, a British colonial administrator once called the Mongolian fringe of India. And you know, essentially all the tribal ethnic peoples who live there have close historical and ethnic connectivities to Southwest China, to, uh, to Burma, to Thailand, and uh, the rest of Southeast Asia. So I think it's the logic of history, the logic of uh, development really entails that ties between Northeast India and Southeast Asia should become much stronger, and Japan is playing its part in that. You mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative, the OBOR, the Chinese OBOR, and uh, how India did not participate in the latest forum that the Chinese uh, were bringing together. And here I think it was an issue of, um, of security, sovereignty, and connectivity. And I think the Modi-Trump joint statement mentions that very uh, unambivalently when it speaks of the need for more uh, responsible financing patterns, the need for respect for sovereignty, and the need for more transparency. And I don't believe the Japanese would disagree with that. We haven't had a joint affirmation of this position. India is a member, a founding member of the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank. In fact, we have an Indian vice president at the bank today. And, uh, but you know, the difficulties with OBOR and BRI have really stemmed from China's development of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, uh, which uh, runs through territory uh, that is uh, claimed by India in the state of Kashmir, but which is currently under Pakistani occupation. So there's an unresolved territorial dispute there. And uh, the Chinese have, uh, have gone ahead, given their close and very uh, you know, flourishing security and strategic relationship with Pakistan to build linkages to, uh, to the Indian Ocean through Pakistan across territory claimed by India. So that really is where the problem has arisen. There are other areas where India and China are cooperating. Take the Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar corridor. There are, you know, obviously there is scope for other projects where we can all work together, uh, even Japan, India, and uh, China, and the other, you know, Asian countries involved. But this particular aspect of the OBOR has <coughs> caused difficulties for India, and I think very legitimately so. I don't think anybody can really take exception to the stand that India has adopted on this. I believe that um, there, if there are three areas in which you know, the relationship between India and Japan uh, should be viewed, the prism or the perspective through which we should view, one of course is the development uh, axis, as it were, the development angle, which in which China, uh, which Japan will continue to play an extremely important and very high profile role in India's growth story. The second area would be, of course, security and defense, with Japan's own evolving position on cooperative collective defense in in the region. Its ability, its uh, you know, its stated willingness. Uh, to uh, to enter into um, military to military cooperation with with India, uh, and also in the supply of equipment uh, in the future, we haven't seen too much happening on that front. There are still areas to be ironed out, but I think with the growing interoperability that you see now between India and the United States, with the growth of purchases of defense equipment, the whole supply chain that is now being developed, the uh, logistics uh, uh, exchange memorandum that we have now entered into with the United States. All this offers cues for India-Japan uh, cooperation also, and I believe that we will see much more on that front in the months and years to come. So we must highlight the security and defense aspects of the relationship, particularly in the context of the maritime commons in, in the Indian Ocean, in the Indo-Pacific, in the context of domain awareness, in the context of freedom of navigation, although the Japanese have been somewhat cautious, I think, about entering into 
to, uh, you know, the freedom of navigation operations too overtly, and I think they have reason to be a little cautious. We all, both India and Japan, uh, have uh, obviously our concerns about China, and I think there are sensitivities, and there is need also for both our countries to maintain a certain, uh, you know, not allow the equilibrium uh, to become too uncertain and to to become too fragile when it comes to our relations with China. We share India with China a border, a disputed border of over uh, cl uh, close to 3,000 miles. And the Chinese may dispute that, say it's only 2,500 miles, but we say it's a little more. Yeah. But in, even there, we don't agree, as you can see. <laughs> and, uh, and therefore, we will, uh, you know, we, we have a very, um, a volatile situation at the moment. Uh, we've had standoffs, uh, we've had transgressions, uh, as we see it from the Chinese side in certain areas, uh, in the eastern sector of the border particularly, as also in, in the Jammu and Kashmir area, where in, this, in the region of Ladakh, as you know, we have a disputed border also with China. So there is this whole issue of uh, uh, the trust and the confidence uh, that uh, that is, that is diminished as a quotient in this relationship with China. And I believe Japan faces similar uh, challenges when it comes to dealing with its, uh, with its uh, Western neighbor, China. With us, of course, it is our Eastern neighbor. But uh, this, uh, there is scope, therefore, I think, for both our countries to, to have a much closer dialogue and engagement on issues relating uh, to China and how we are going to be able to tackle this challenge. But ultimately, I think these problems that we face with China have also to be handled individually by each of us because the context, the, uh, the nature of the challenge may differ for, for both our countries. The linkages uh, ultimately with the evolving situation in the Indo-Pacific is where this relationship, I believe, is going to be situated in, in, in the future. Whether it comes to trade with the uh, Trump administration's decision to leave the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, we'll have to see what kind of patterns within Asia we're able to evolve on regional trading patterns. Apart from bilateral, we have the regional comprehensive economic partnership idea and uh, and uh, you know the project has still not accomplished, but certainly it's been mentioned as a kind of uh, alternative, not as ambitious, not as uh, comprehensive as the TPP, but certainly that's some that's a work that ha is in progress, and we'll have to see how far it goes. I think the ultimately in for the region. You know, when we look at security, when we look at counterterrorism, when we look at, you know, Japan and India's role on the global stage, let's not forget Japan and India have worked together over the last 12 years at least within the G4, uh, that is with Brazil and Germany, together with Japan and India, uh, to push forward this campaign to expand the permanent membership of the UN Security Council. And Japan and India have worked together on that, and uh, we haven't had much success. But there again, it speaks of our uh, common uh, you know, aspirations for a greater role in world affairs, as we see it, a legitimate need for that. So we are definitely acting east when it comes to Japan, when it comes to our relationship with Japan. And the scope for the growth and expansion of our ties with Japan, uh, you know, is clear for all of us to see. This is a relationship with <coughs> great mutual trust and great mutual confidence. And I think it can offer, even as it can be a model for even India and the US when we look at the expansion of our relations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, well thank you, Ambassador Rowan. Thank you to all of you. Some really, just very, uh, thank you. Um, very comprehensive look at this uh, very interesting and complex relationship. But the downside is that our time is short. I do want to uh, 
offer uh, the opportunity for to at least have uh, four or five questions. I'll forego my opportunity to ask one. That doesn't matter. Um, if we could have a show of hands, uh, we'll take it four or five questions consecutively. And incidentally, Tom, if you'd like, uh, when you're responding, if you may want to address, if you'd like, the two very good questions uh, that Chihoko put on the table, one about prospects for increased trade relations between India and Japan, and two, the potential for trilateral U.S.-India-Japan uh, cooperation on some of these immediate threats in the Indo-Pacific region, North Korea, among among others. So. Um, if you have any questions, okay, we'll start uh, in the back there. Yep. Thank you. Uh, M.G. Ning Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. You, um, would you discuss the role of the South China Sea and ASEAN and especially Vietnam in the context of India, Japan, U.S. and China with the recent happenings uh, of <coughs> uh, the President Trump meeting with uh, President Nguyen Xuân Phúc of Vietnam, and also that meeting with um, John McCain went to South China Sea, and the, the oldest movement of Japan, India, and, and um, militarily, how does that affect or uh, impact China on the South China Sea? Okay, thanks. Other questions? Okay, so this is the gentleman in the back, right in front of you, Joshua. Yep. Uh, yeah, hi. I just had a question um, about, I know you mentioned the G4 nations um, uh, vying for, for the UN Security Council permanent membership. Um, I know, or at least I think at one point, that China had stated that it would support Indian membership uh, in exchange for a reduction of support for Japan, or withdrawal of support, I should say. Um, and I was wondering uh, if you had any comments about that, and in general, I think kind of a segue into um, a similar topic. What actions has China taken, do you think, to try to entice India or Japan to move away from that bilateral relationship and possibly toward a stronger one with China? And if you think that that'll become a point of divergence at any point in the future, or if that, you know, if there'll be any success in China's efforts in that regard? Okay, uh, we will we'll take the question here from the woman in the front, and then we'll go to the gentleman on this side. Thank you. Um, as India-Japan strategic cooperation uh, implication uh, for China in the, that uh, uh, go to explain there is a, a short term, mid term and long term. And I would like to bring that uh, China development on Shanghai um, organization uh, cooperation, SOC. How do you think that the impact on from uh, long term on that issue. Thank okay, you. Okay, thanks. And the last question. Oh, you got the mic. Excellent. Yeah, hi there. Uh, I'm Agni from Brookings. I uh, had a similar question, actually, based on what was asked by the previous uh, 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 commentator. Uh, it's really about India joining the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the implications on India Japan relations going forward. Uh, and to what extent will that impact the relations with China and the US as well? Thank you. All right, let's, let's stop there. Um, Tom, did you want to start off? Yeah, great. Certainly, well, several themes and threads here. Let me just touch on them uh, uh, briefly. I mean, let me, let me turn to uh, the question by uh, Shioku. I mean, the, the, the pair of them, you know, one, you know, would, would deeper trade with India and Japan be a possibility? Uh, how would, you know, U.S. engagement in that work out? Um, I mean, I, I think there is a, in our, our research and our work, we found that there's a, there's a natural desire for enhanced and increased trade between um, India and Japan. Um, I think that uh, uh, interlocutors in India's Ministry of External Affairs recognized that India's youthful population and educated population is a, um, a valuable uh, element of things that Japan, Japan can tap into. Um, and their thinking was with more offshore investment, more engagement there, and then product remitting back to Japan. So I think there's, a, there's an aspiration, there's a way of seeing that forward uh, that, that both sides have seen. When we talk to uh, economic advisors in Japan, uh, there, there wasn't quite as much thoughtful um, um, exposition of how that might happen, but there nonetheless was this, this notion that yes, you know, India's population gives us options and opportunities that maybe we thought we had with China 30 years ago, but that now are coming with too high of a cost, and India can provide that as an alternative. So I, I think there is a natural element there, and I think that, you know, goes beyond what or how the U.S. does things in the region. 
Uh, I'm, I'm reminded by the fact here that, that uh, India was not going to be part of the TPP. So it wasn't necessarily that you were going to see that kind of a, uh, of a dynamic uh, happening there. Second, um, you know, we're the U.S. heads right now, and I think we try to allude to that in our conclusion of our paper, um, even as the Trump administration was still about to get seated. Uh, you know, on one level, there is an independent dynamism, as the ambassador mentioned and our paper mentioned, between India and Japan that will move forward. I think the U.S. involvement can make it more strategic and help it move faster. Uh, if, in fact, there's an appreciation in America that the more uh, development and then the more interoperability on a security front that the two countries develop, that that both enhances what is currently an American-led bilateral alliance structure, but helps move it more towards a multilateral complementary structure, at least for the next decade, decade and a half. Unfortunately, I think quite often people in this town want to talk about substitutes for our U.S. presence in the region and then get the cart before the horse. Uh, I think it's, it's important to caution that, that's, that there is not enough security um, capacity right now in the part of either of these countries to suggest that that could happen. And so if our, this administration starts to look at that bilateral relationship as either all or nothing, you know, either a substitute for now or not worth nurturing, then we could have an issue. If instead, as I hope happens, and again, I say as I hope happens, there is a uh, continuous education by Prime Minister Modi uh, in future one-on-ones with President Trump and with Mr. Mattis and uh, with you know, our State Department uh, to, to encourage and nurture that, then, then perhaps we can um, uh, sustain where we've been, which is to move forward uh, and nurture this relationship as a long-term uh, multilateral frame of reference. And in that context, you know, the, the whole trilateral piece right now has been a case of both the United States and uh, Japan wanting to do more trilateral work, but India kind of eschewing that for the time being, which is in keeping with where India has been on multilateralism. And I think most folks believe it's not, it's not something one should push too much right now, but to continue to work to find the time when India would move forward on that. I want to save time for my colleagues to have their commentary. Uh, let me just uh, offer then only on the question about the, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, and I've experienced the Shanghai Cooperation Organization having lived and worked uh, in uh, Afghanistan when it was stood up, having seen it contrasted to the CTSO, which is the Russian uh, organization that's, that's led there, and then contrasted to NATO. Um, you know, I think right now China, you know, allowing or assenting to India to move in there is basically going to be a recipe for, for, for an organization that already has limited to no real uh, value added to now be more like Sark and being deadlocked, right? So I think that's what we've moved into. Uh, I don't know what the Chinese aim was here. Maybe they thought by letting them in there that India would be more receptive to one belt, one road, or we be more you know, amenable on challenges that uh, the, the CPEC causes in the Kashmir corridor. Uh, I don't see that, having you know, seen this up close and personal, see that kind of a, of a thaw or interoperability coming. I think it's just a recipe for more gridlock. And I'll leave the other com questions for my c colleagues. Yeah, do either of you two want to respond to what Tom had to say very briefly or address any of the questions? Um, j just a, um, a comment about um, Tom's issue, um, response. I actually believe that if, if we look at the new phase of um, Japan-India relations, one of the biggest issues is going to be the evolution of economic relations. So until now, it's been very much a... Uh, Japan investing in India either from the public sector or the private sector, but Japan needs India very much. And that need for Japan for, for not only um, uh, the, the people, but also the knowledge base that India has will only increase. We are in the, in the throes of an, an industrial revolution, a fourth industrial revolution, which is based on knowledge and, and, and information and the exchange of ideas. And if you look at Silicon Valley, um, the dynamism there is very, it would not be possible without the Indian diaspora. You see the dynamism of um, the Indian um, population uh, worldwide. And Japan would very much like to tap into that and it ensure, uh, ensure that Indians find Japan equally luc lucrative to, to do business as well. Right now, it's not. It's not appealing for Indians for a number of reasons. Um, but 
that, that's one challenge that Japan has to become an attractive site for Indians to come. Um, another one is the fact that Japan is having this tremendous demographic um, time bomb. 25% uh, of its population will be over 65 years of age within the next 15 years or so. And as you said, India has a very youthful, dynamic population. Are there ways for um, a, a kind of um, a, a flow of people and not just ideas and capital uh, to, to offset that? So again, I believe that Japan will be more increasingly more dependent on India for its econo economic base as well. If I could mention in that context, the the people-to-people the -people interactions between India and Japan are, are, are pretty low. But both prime ministers have tried to adjust that by giving um, accelerated uh, visa access to critical parts of each country in the last two years. I mean, there have been reciprocal, you know, quick visa opportunities made available to Japanese going and traveling to India, and then Japan has done somewhat the, the, the reverse to get more Indians there. So to your point, I think it's, that's correct. I think both sides are seeing this, but I think they're seeing this as a little longer lead time type mm -hmm. of uh, idea, you know, a couple of, couple of decades trying to build that kind of uh, engagement. Can I yeah. come in here? Yeah. Uh, you know, just to uh, talk about, uh, you know, the China, India, Japan sort of uh, triangulation here. Now, with China, despite the fact that India has these problems, these territorial, the territorial dispute, the whole issue of India-China competition in the region, the relationship of China with <coughs> Pakistan, Despite all that, over the last decade or so, the relationship, the trading relationship between India and China has grown to the level that China is today our largest trading partner in goods, not in services, but in goods, with a total volume of about 70 billion US dollars in trade between the two countries, which is huge for India. I, uh, and the Chinese don't give up easily. Now, this week uh, we had this news about the Chinese mobile handset manufacturer, Vivo, wh which is big in India, having retained the Indian cricketing Premier League title sponsorship rights for the next five seasons <laughs> with a winning bid of 341 million US dollars. So this is despite all the you know, ups and downs in our relationship with China. But in the case, uh, I think, you know, there's a lot perhaps that you can learn from this kind of persistence and, and you know, hanging in their attitude of the Chinese. And maybe we should see more of Japanese involvement in the popular sphere in India. Let me tell you that Japanese manga comics are very, very popular <laughs> in India, <laughs> extremely popular. As also uh, Miss Japan this year, and you may know that, is half Indian, half Japanese. And she's gorgeous. And <laughs> so, you know, the whole issue of Indian people coming to Japan and Japanese being more comfortable about dealing with mm -hmm. foreigners and with Indians, I think uh, we hope that can change. We just have about 27,000 Indians living in Japan today. Mm -hmm. We have close to 4 million Indians living in the US mm -hmm. today, uh, Indian Americans and Indians. So you can see uh, you know, how barriers, when broken down, can change pers perspectives. Now, the issue of China on India's membership of the uh, permanent membership of the UN Security Council, uh, I'm afraid one has to say that the Chinese have not yet supported that membership. They, of course, they say that they will not stand in the way, but that is you know, not the same as expressing unequivocal support. And I think behind the scenes, there's a lot of uh, you know, actions that go on that don't essentially promote <coughs> India's case in which China tends to be you know, involved. And that comes even to the membership of the nuclear su suppliers group, as you know, and the Chinese attitude. I didn't mention when we spoke of India-Japan relations about the energy component of this relationship and the whole issue of energy security. And Japan, after many years of uh, hesitation, has now dropped its uh, objections to uh, nuclear cooperation with India. Uh, because India is not a member of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and Japan has a whole you know, position on that. But it is a measure of the growing trust and confidence in the relationship that the two countries have now signed a civil nuclear deal, as it were, uh, at the end of last year. And uh, I hope we'll have to see how that opens the way for Japan-India cooperation in the development of civil nuclear energy.
in which, as you know, the US, Russia, France, are some of the other countries involved. Although with the United States, that cooperation, the promise that the nuclear deal offered has not really translated into actual power projects on the ground because of various uh, issues that, that uh, had uh, you know, caused certain uh, problems but which are being ironed out now. And I believe Westinghouse, uh, the company that is basically involved in this cooperation, is going to uh, sort out these issues before the end of the year. We'll have to see. But Westinghouse isn't in a very good place at the moment, we all know. Um, so, so there is this cooperation in the nuclear field or new civil nuclear field that um, has, has come about between India and Japan, and that's a huge, huge give, I think, from the Japanese point of view and, and must be noted as a decision of some strategic significance. Now, when it comes to India joining the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, I noticed that Tom mentioned it could end up with a SARC-like or South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation kind of situation where nothing moves, nothing happens, things are at a standstill. But I think India's joining, uh, India and Pakistan, incidentally, have joined the SEO together. So that introduces. <laughs> that, that was my point. They're joining together. So. A dynamic. <laughs> but we, we, you know, I think India's coming into the SEO uh, is essentially to build more bridges with Central Asia. And uh, the Russians are also a very much a part of the SCO, as you know. And you mentioned Chabahar. You mentioned this whole North-South corridor. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, there is the issue of energy, energy security. There is the issue of more connectivity, which India really doesn't have with Central Asia because of the issues that we face with Pakistan. We can't get into Afghanistan via Pakistan. We've had to build civil aviation bridges. We've had to you know, look at how we can develop Chabahar port. So given these constraints, I think it is uh, essential that India tries to um, open as many outlets to Central Asia as possible. And the SEO can be one of them. It may not be the best, but I think it offers certain opportunities. And I think we shouldn't, uh, you know, close our minds entirely to what the SEO can do for this. I think these are some of the points. If I could, I, I didn't want to neglect the, the yeah, question about quick, uh, uh, Vietnam uh, and the impact in South China Sea, ma'am. I mean, just, just in short order, I mean, I think there's already a record of diplomatically, you know, both India and Japan uh, speaking out, you know, against activities and choices being made by the Chinese with respect to these man-made islands, with respect to access and limiting access. And I would point to the fact that India, in the last decade, since 2007, <laughs> has had at least, by my count, three separate ships go and transit through to port areas in Vietnam that the Chinese were warning the Indians not to transit to because of disputed claims between Vietnam and China. And I just see that again as a case where, you know, China will diplomatically and symbolically stand up and, and with the limited resources it has, show itself in support of free trade and show itself in support of freedom of navigation. So I think there is evidence of that already there. If anyone is expecting anything much more than that anytime soon, I think you're mistaken, but I think you'll still see that diplomatic, rhetorical, and then symbolic gestures to show a disagreement with any kind of ossified or sovereignty claim uh, in the South China Sea region. Yeah, and incidentally, as, as you probably know, ma'am, India and Vietnam not too long ago signed an energy agreement that entails uh, oil exploration rights for India in the South China Sea, uh, so that's important to keep in mind. Unfortunately, we've gone over time. Uh, we could be here for, for many more hours discussing this, but if you didn't get a, a copy of Tom's report outside, please do so. It's very much worth a read. If you could have a round of applause for our entire panel. <laughs> Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have more time for questions. Thank you, Thank you so much. Great to see you. Welcome again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good. And I've already talked to Michael, but I look forward to staying in touch with you because I know you're doing several other projects Definitely. about the Far East. Definitely.